barely tall enough to get over this <laughs> lectern. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. I really, um, I very much appreciate you letting a Yankee into your building. Thank you so much. Tonight, I want to talk a little bit about bravery and social constructs. A lot of people probably think I'm going to talk about Hollywood, but for me, Hollywood was always just a, a way of really honestly making a living. And while I was making a living, I got to see some very bad and uh, uh, some very bad behavior, let's we'll just put it that way, and, and some serious abuse of power. But where does that start? I grew up in a cult. I grew up in a world-famous cult called Children of God. And what that taught me was that the world is a cult. It taught me that the world has constructs about gender, about race, about identity, about fear. That's cult-like thinking. Anytime you support a power structure that does not support you, you're in a cult. I had a lot of people who would say to me, I'm so sorry for how you lived. And I would say, so, I'm so sorry for how you live now. Because I saw them in a watered down version of what I had so deeply implanted into me. And when I came to America when I was 10, I saw the propaganda machine in full force. And it was telling me, here's what you are as a girl. And this is what you can't do. And then I would look over to my right and I would see a boy. Here's what you are as a boy and here's what you are. So girls, it's almost a can't-do thing, and boys, it's what you are. And both are inaccurate. We're free human beings. A lot of people think that being brave doesn't mean you're not scared. I always say it just means you do the scary thing anyway. And one of the things I did growing up was to realize that if I made myself less than, that I would be let, letting them win, whoever them are. And it's, it's that kind of false identifier as, as a form of reality that, that so tricks us, whether it be by Hollywood's machinations or our own or our parents or societal structure, whatever it gives us isn't what we actually are. I think it's incumbent upon us to look at our own belief systems, to see what they mean, to see where our illusions of power come from, to see what are our fears and what have been implanted in us. I always say, look at your life like a tapestry. What are the uh, threads in it that are organic to you? And what are the threads that have been implanted in you? We can take what we want and we can leave the rest and pull out those filaments, those synthetic fibers that aren't ours, the ones that tell us this is what you are as a man, this is what you are as a woman, this is what you are as gay, trans, whatever it is. And that's one of the things when I got to Hollywood that helped me realize that Hollywood had a real cult-like structure. It supports the power at the top while preying on the weaker. The thing that makes me so upset about Hollywood isn't the films. Granted, they are, there are a lot of problems in films. It's more that it gives society the mirror to look in. Here's what you are. But the problem is that the DGA, that's the Directors Guild of America, is 96% male. And I'm not saying this against men, it's just how it's been, and that statistic hasn't changed since 1946. So you're getting a really binary view of what your life is, of what you are. And when you get taken to the movies, or you watch TV and you think it's just free entertainment, there's a much higher price that you might be paying without even being fully aware of it. The male gaze is something that I suffered from and under for a very long time. And I, it's not just the director or the producer, it's, it's everybody involved, but it also really involves the women. Hollywood is a treacherous place with a really glossy image, but it also gave me the motivation 
and the clarity to see injustice firsthand and to see why that wouldn't stand and to see why we could be different and how we can be better and how we can change ourselves, how we can be free. The way to be free is to really unwire your thoughts. That was one of the things I watched my father do in the cult. I watched him wire people's minds and play them against each other for personal gain or for the glory of power, all of which is an illusion. But I decided in my book, Brave, that comes out today in paperback, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> to talk about freedom and how we can get free and how we can get brave. One of the biggest things that I like to do on a regular basis is make a list of my fears. And it gives me a clear road map for how to go ahead in my life. So many times we're afraid to do things. We're told to be quiet, don't rock the boat, don't make anybody uncomfortable. But the more you give away your power, in each little instance in your day, just an innocuous meeting where you're giving your power away, just to make somebody more comfortable in the short term, it means you're giving yourself away. And that adds up and it chisels away at who you are and who you can be. I get asked a lot about Me Too. And I was on a book tour when that really kicked off. But I've been an activist for a long time. And my movement is really just freedom of thought. Do you think differently? Do you want to be a better person? You can be. The way to do it is to really unwire your mind. Because once you unwire it, and you get free of these beliefs that have been implanted in you from before you had a chance to say, yeah, I want to sign up for this. You know, you were stolen. I saw it really clearly. I was raised without mirrors for the first 10 years of my life. I was raised not as a race and not as a gender. And they gave me a very different perspective on the world when I came out and I faced myself in the mirror for the first time. I didn't know what I was. I didn't know what I was looking at. They changed my name from Rosa to Rose at the first American school I went to. They told me I didn't want to sound Mexican. It's a deeply troubled place, that country. I got sent there from Italy, which is also another troubled place, but I grew up kind of in the country away from and, and really just with the inhabitants of the commune that I grew up in. But the gift that it gave me was something that I don't think I could have gotten had I been born into regular society. The gift of seeing how cult-like thought infiltrates your mind on a daily basis and how it hardwires you to think less of yourself. It hardwires you to give your strength away and your creativity away. It hardwires you to feel like you are less than. But less than what? Than the free person you're meant to be? I don't think that's enough. Hollywood may seem like it's a really far away place, and it might seem, and it is for a lot of people, a bit hard to understand. And you see these glossy contents, you know, splashed across the pages of magazines or on your screen at night. But what if you're seeing a character, a woman character in a movie, and every time you see her, for some unknown reason, she's carrying a laundry basket? A script was sent to me last year. My character was carrying a laundry basket in every scene, although she never did any laundry. It was just one of those, this is what you are as a woman things. And I started thinking about that and thinking about how somebody at home isn't going to notice that laundry basket there every time the mom comes in the room for no apparent reason. And I thought these are the exact kind of things we need to look at our culture and our entertainment with a critical eye, again, of take what you want and leave the rest. You know, if you don't believe in power structures, as I don't, and you don't believe in indoctrination, as I don't, and most of us would say we're anti that, but then you watch things or you hear things and you don't realize how much it takes away from you without you even realizing it. And I think there's something I would implore you the next time you watch anything from Hollywood 
just to look at it, identify what the messaging system is about race, what it is about gender, what it is actually telling you, and at what cost, because it can take so much away from us without us even realizing it. We are free, beautiful beings, and that's something that nobody can take from us, not for any $10 a month Netflix, you know, sign up, and not for any price of a movie theater. When I came out publicly about a year and a half ago, it was a long process and it was something I had long planned to do. And a lot of things have shifted in the world since then. I wanted to push a reset on cultural values and cultural mores. And I wanted to show us where we could be different, where we could be better, and so that's all I do. I'm an activist through and through. My father said I was born with a fist up in the air. My book is called Brave because my nickname was the brave one growing up. It's kind of a curse. It's not always the most fun way to be. But if I can be here to inspire any of you to be just that much braver in your own lives, then I'm happy to be here. And I know you can be. I know you have it in you just by being brave. Thank you. So Rose, Leslie, thank you so much. And I wanted to <coughs> pick up on something you raised. How do you think we can help ourselves or try and help others to raise our consciousness if we've been so subconsciously indoctrinated by whatever it is, be it the media, be it films, be it just our culture, if you're not even realizing that you're being indoctrinated, what do you think you can do to try and get yourself out of that trap? That's a great question. I think one of the things you can do, I really, really believe in listing your beliefs and start really analyzing where they come from. And not even like the bigger beliefs, but like the subheaders, right? Like the ABC underneath the main thing. Um, what got you to that belief system? What got you into the relationship that you're in? What got you into where you are at work, where you are at school? Do you have a hand in it, or is this just being swept along? And I think there's ways to look at it, you know. It's just, partially it's growing older. Partially it's knowing yourself. But a lot of it is really looking at the messaging systems. And it's not just the basic, like, you know, we use young women to sell sexy products. It goes a lot deeper than that. <coughs> what do they sell to men? How do you view yourself? You know, and how old were you when they started telling you you had to be a certain way because you were born in a certain way? And that's what we have to start looking at. And, and I think really, um, pushing back at. It's really the only way to be free is through it. I don't think we can say, you know, America, they have these bumper stickers on the back of cars that say, no fear. <laughs> <laughs> to me, it's one of the most fear-ridden places that I've ever been. But I think if you are fearless and look at your strengths, your weaknesses, and look at why you have your strengths and see that they came organically from you, and not from what others told you, I think it'll go a long way to solving that. So I wanted to ask about, <coughs> so the Me Too movement seems to have been so successful because Hollywood, as you said, acts like a microcosm to what is a, a bigger macro reality of a problem. But then how do you think that movements like Me Too need to expand and extrapolate and kind of join onto wider movements like the Women's March so that it actually kind of touches women um, from all ages, from all spectrums, all across the world and the problems that really affect everyone? Well, I'm not a spokesperson for Me Too. When Tarana Burke started Me Too, the hashtag 10 years ago, I think it's really simply a communication tool. Did this happen to you? Me Too. Because previously there was no way to communicate these things with each other. Uh, and I think movement, that word, associated with Me Too is largely a media-created construct that 
it made it sound like there's a thousand women in the streets with pitchforks running after men. And I don't know about you, but I haven't seen any pitchforks lately. You know? Uh, <laughs> it's simply, I, I believe it was just time for a cultural reset. And I, it has expanded. I was just in India and a girl stood up in the middle of a speech I was giving and it was in a room filled with billionaires and the Prime Minister of India. And this is an Indian girl, and she stood up and she was crying and she said, me too. And that's, I think, what me too has achieved worldwide. But as far as something that's a, a movement, I think it's a movement of thought. I don't think it's something that's necessarily in the streets. I think it's just us thinking differently. So where do you think this change goes next, or how does it continue to grow? Does the movement, if that's a, does it need a leader, or does it need, or kind of just organically continue to grow and evolve, or does it need to be fueled another way? I think it's an organic thing. I really believe it's kind of like once you wake up, and until you get Alzheimer's, you're awake. You're not going to go backwards unless you're a power abuser. And in that case, you have a very specific and different kind of mind from the rest of us. You know, I think we've all known those people at our jobs or in school where, God, wouldn't it be great if this one human was not doing what they were doing? Well, there are answers to that, you know, and, and if we clear a pathway, then that's how the good people come up. But I think it's really incumbent upon us to be better. One night I was sitting at home and I was thinking like, could I be a better person and by what percentage? And I came up with a completely arbitrary number of 10%. That seemed like a doable thing. And that's actually my movement. My thing was seeing if I could get the world to kind of wake up by about 10%. And then Me Too kind of happened right after, well, I'd been on that track for about four years and then Me Too came in and I was doing a book tour, so everyone was asking me Me Too-related questions, and I kind of became the unwitting face of it, although never wanting to be, because my movement is actually just about changing consciousness and getting people to be brave in their own lives. Are you glad that you kind of, that role fell upon you, or is it something that you kind of resisted when it occurred? Or I think I resist it even now, to an extent. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real binary topic, in a way. It doesn't, and that could be just because of how the media that I've had, all the interviews I've done, all the, you know, they ask you the same questions over and over, and I just think this is a much bigger subject with so much more nuance than we've been allowed to have. You know, we just, I just thought it was time for the world to grow up and have a different conversation. But a lot of people do try to go backwards with thought. And I think we can only go forwards. So it seems like this, the thought movement, when, once it gets momentum, that's what propels it forward. And it requires yes. people to continue to be brave, to speak out, to keep it moving forward. Yes. And I wanted to ask about your and the New York Times piece. Before that came out, what was that like in trying to be brave and see that getting out? What's the whole process and journey? So I set up the article in the New York Times. Uh, I called them about 10 months before it came out. And I got in touch with them and I said, the bad guy, whose name I'm sure we all know by now, uh, is after me. He's trying to shut down publication of my book. I need your help. And the story is bigger than you can even imagine. The night before the story came out, I met my current partner. I know, who wouldn't want to go out with me at that point in time? <laughs> I mean, sign me up. Uh, <laughs> and, and I told my partner now, but back then it was just this human that I was meeting. I said, the world is going to change tomorrow. You don't know it, but the world is going to change tomorrow. And she just thought, okay, crazy lady. <laughs> okay. And I probably was a little crazy. It was, it was like gearing up to do battle globally. I felt the night before that article came out, I was swinging balls of fire in my hands, just getting 
to strengthen the energy up for the battle that I knew was going to come. And it, and it was, I had, I had ex Mossad in my life. I had, it, it's just a crazy story, the behind the scenes of the story. The story behind the story is insane, and someday I will tell that, but it is a very peculiar feeling to know what the next day is going to bring and the domino effect it's going to have. Could I have foreseen a worldwide domino effect? Yes. So is that what, <coughs> is seeing that worldwide domino, what helped you get it through? Or was that not part of it? Was it just something that you knew that you had to do for yourself or? I knew that it was something, no, it was really not for myself. A long, long time ago, I had told my abuser, I said, if I hear of you doing this to another woman, I will come for you. That was 20 years ago. And I immediately heard of him doing this to somebody else. And I thought, well, now I have a project. And it was a long, very hard, ugly project. You know, and sometimes there's ugliness in the world. Sometimes, sometimes it is ugly. It's like when you clean your closet, you make a huge mess, right? But then it gets cleaned up. I thought the domino effect, if we could show people worldwide what it's like to stand up to power, and his power didn't just come from Hollywood, it came from the Democratic Party. He was completely protected by them. And so it was a huge base of power to unseat individually. But also if you can show that you can unseat that kind of power, it inspires people then globally to take matters into their own hands. Then I wanted, the last thing that I want to talk about before we hand over to the audience is the debate we had earlier <coughs> in this term was all about whether or not you can separate the art from the artist and is that as a movement. I think that's only become more timely now with the revelations about, or the <coughs> allegations about Michael Jackson. Um, what do you think about that issue as a... It's such a hard issue. Uh, we were discussing this before I came on stage and um, I don't think you can separate and I think you can still enjoy certain things from artists but understand there's always going to be an asterisk. And I think it's incumbent upon us to educate ourselves with what that asterisk means. And can we square ourselves with that, you know? I love Michael Jackson's music. Do I love what he did to these children? No. No. And I think you can be an incredibly talented artist and also an incredibly tortured soul who hurts others. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. And I think it's just time for a broader conversation. And I'm happy you guys are having that conversation. I would love to say, yes, you always have to separate art from the artist. There's no way, I just don't, it's not practical. And then you would have to remove all of history and the arts and literature and later on film, everything that we kind of consume, you know? And, but I'll tell you, how many times have people probably gone to an accountant and not known he was a child molester? It just happens that artists are very visible people. And I'm not saying their, their private proclivities shouldn't be sanctioned or shouldn't be stopped if they have ill intentions towards others. But just know that it doesn't mean you're bad if you still enjoy a song by somebody who was a child molester. It just means that they were a child molester and they make good music. It's a really, it's an unfortunate thing to have to face. But I think that's also part of what we're doing now as a society, which is just growing up. You're growing up culturally. When you were little and you got taller, your legs hurt, right? But you got taller. In my case, I didn't get that much taller. <laughs> but I got a little taller. And it taught me that growth is pain. And sometimes we do have to go through the ugly parts of things to get taller. And I think collectively that's what we're doing right now. <coughs> right now, I think it's a good time to move over to audience questions. So if you have a question, just put your hand up and wait for the microphone uh, to be brought to you. Um, yeah, madam, let's get to the hand. 
Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Um, I was, I'm doing research on people's opinions of Me Too and feminism more generally. And a lot of people who are anti-feminists see uh, feminists as, uh, feminism as a misandric ideology. And they think that feminists are waging a sex war. Uh, where do you think those perceptions come from and how do you think that uh, feminists like around the world can change these? Well, I think a lot of it and that image of what feminists, you know, are gets sold to us by the propaganda machine. A lot of that is Hollywood. Feminism was around before then, but maybe not with the word. It's kind of like how in the 80s, Russia, you know, it was the propaganda was that all Russian women were heavy with beards. Believe it or not, when I came to America, that's what they were telling people, that Russian women, you know, are generally very heavy and they have beards and are hairy. Uh, it's kind of like how they warn off people from feminism. And to me, <coughs> Feminism is just, do you believe in equal pay and equal rights? Congratulations, you two are a feminist. It's pretty basic. I don't know how to fight it. I get a lot of people coming at me for being feminist, but that's okay, I can take it. Do I think it's a, 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 a sex war? Is that what you called it? Yeah, I think that's what um, a lot of anti-feminists think, that feminists want a sex war and they don't want equality. They just want women to have more power, basically. That's the whole misconception, but that's no different than every place that's anti-immigrant. You know, it's the same argument. I think overall that, that argument is just so boring. It, we're so tired, we've all heard it so much, right? And, and, oh, they're all coming here to steal our jobs. Or if women get more power, they're gonna, what, turn into big power abusers like us? I don't know uh, what, you know what I mean? It's like this whole thing of like, then what'll happen? <coughs> I don't know, we'll have a more peaceful world maybe? <laughs> um, and if there are jerks, we'll see, you know? But we've never had that, so it's hard to tell. It's all conjecture at this point. The only way to combat propaganda is through honesty and is through deconstruction and seeing truth. And I think we all know that, I, I think anyway, that feminism is not that I'm trying to be more than you. It, to me, the bigger question is like, can you see me as a human? Can I see you as a human? And I think if we can see each other as human, then we might actually be able to move forward. Let's take another question then. Yeah, to the hand just along. Thank you so much for coming to uh, speak to us here. Um, I just wanted to ask something. I thought it was quite interesting what you said about resisting being the face of um, the Me Too movement. I wonder, um, do you think it's potentially fair to say like that this is because, I don't know, like if you speak out about something that's happened to you, you don't want to be defined by the trauma? I wonder if you could say anything else about that. That's a very good question. It's very apt, and yes, it's true. I don't want to be defined by that, nor does I think anybody who is a survivor of, uh, well, anything that you've had to survive. You know, what if people only asked you about the one tra traumatic thing that happened to you and you're not the one, but a specific incident over and over and over and over, it kind of fries your brain and it's very triggering. <coughs> For me, kind of being painted as the face of me too, unwittingly, It did put me in a box, yeah. But it kind of was for the greater good. So I understood that I had to just suck it up and take the hits. And hopefully that as time goes by, we can have a more nuanced conversation and we can see that 
it's a very sexist thing to define somebody by who attacked them. If it, you know, in my case especially, uh, if it's it, meaning if it's a male attacker, you know, um, it doesn't lead to great mental health. <laughs> but I think, yeah, I think I'm moving beyond that, and and uh, it's a good thing to grow, and it's time to heal. And I think collectively, you know, I could call 2018 the year of the trigger, and I think that would be pretty on point. Not just for me, but for so many of us in the world. And I think we're kind of in a healing phase now, and I think that's a beautiful thing. And let's take another question. If there is one. Hi, Hi. thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, I just think that you're phrase of you need to unwire your brain it's such a deliberative you know deliberate task where you have to be cognizant of the female character always holding the laundry basket and so I was just wondering how do you train yourself to to view that and how do you encourage you know your friends and your neighbors to also kind of take that step to unwire your brain basically Great question. I, th you know, for me, the way that I do it is when somebody says something to me, if I'm not um, starting the conversation or we're not in a conversation about how to be better, which you oftentimes do not find yourself in unless you bring it up. It's not casual, you know, pub conversation, let's be real. But if we can start breaking it down one of the things that I do is when someone will say something to me that kind of rubs me slightly the wrong way, and instead of attacking or anything like that, I just, a I just simply ask, oh, why would you say that? Why would you ask me that? And then wait and pause and give them a moment to see in their head, why did they ask me that? Was it because of pre-programmed thinking? Why did I say that? Huh. I need to look at that. I mean, it's almost like it sucks that in this lifetime that we're gonna have to do that a lot. It's not fair. But in this lifetime, I think it's incumbent upon us to leave the room better than when we came in. And I think we can do that both with ourselves and with our friends and with our neighbors and with <coughs> our allies and with our lovers, you know, with anything. I would just say if you went and watched any show on TV, if you want to just use that as a test case, you could start looking at the things in there that are, you know, it, it reminds me of this show where they showed the woman walking home at night and the, the, it was two guys and they left the bar with their woman friend, but she had to go a separate way. So it shows the two guys walking home and they're like, high five, woo, and just like, walking home and she's like gets her keys out and she's like da -da -da, da -da -da, da -da -da, you know and they those they looked at it but normally in a movie you would have just the girl walking home alone down the street which of course would mean she was about to be attacked in the movie but let's say she's just walking down the street in that scene it wouldn't bring in the cultural feeling that we know which is walking down the street at night can be very scary Right? Maybe not around here, but in most places. And I think if we just start dissecting things, it doesn't make it fun always, but I think it's important. Let's take another question. Yeah, the hand here, and then we'll get down to the back. Hi, um, Hi. Thank you so much for coming and all that you're doing. Um, my question is two pronged. Um, if you could speak to yourself um, as a young actress in view of what you've suffered at the hands of the industry, what would you say to her? And um, what would you say to a young actor entering the industry now in this climate? Good question. I would say to myself, it's not you, it's them. It's not you, it's them which is something I deeply suspected but didn't have 100% belief in, but now I've, I'm pretty much at 100%. What I would say to any young person getting into the arts, specifically that industry, 
is just know that you have value and that just because you want to create or you have a feeling in you that needs to be expressed through the form of expression doesn't mean that anybody gets to touch you. Your body is your sovereign right. It doesn't mean that anybody gets to put you down and make you feel less than. You're a sovereign being. And you get to go and create and be the best you that you can be and bring art to the world and go you. And I hope you make a difference. But know that you have the right to be safe in order to create what you need to create. And that you shouldn't have to give that up in order to do so. And then let's take the question. Yeah, come back. Hi, uh, Hi, thank you for coming. You were talking about how the Democratic Party helped cover up Harvey Weinstein's abuses, and I was wondering how far you think the Me Too movement has been able to actually use up the kind of structures of, of power put in place to allow these horrific things to happen. I really feel it's gone a long way towards disrupting the ability to carry this stuff out in secret. You know, Obama's daughter interned for my rapist about six months before the New York Times story came out. And I will say collectively that everybody knew. And that's a really sad thing to hear. It's a sadder thing to be the one who's the victim that knows these things, but sees the powerful getting feted, getting lauded, getting money, getting awards, getting all these things. I do think the Me Too, what's a word that we can use that's not movement? <laughs> Recalibration? It doesn't have a real roll off the tongue sort of thing to it. <laughs> reset? Cultural reset? Yeah. Cultural reset. I think Me Too as a cultural reset has done a lot, and not just in terms of sexual harassment or sexual assault. I think it actually, in terms of what I was doing and how I was fighting um, and, and others, I think it shows that abuse of power just cannot stand and that it's an illusion that we can keep these things private now. And I hope that takes away the complicity machine because that's who's the most guilty. And yes, the Democratic Party was part of the complicity machine. Not to say that Republicans are not also complicit and do their part. <laughs> Let's take another question. Uh, Yep, the hand turned, then we'll come here. Hello. Um, I watched the uh, Kavanaugh hearing with uh, great disbelief, and uh, since you were there, I was wondering how you experienced it firsthand. Well, actually, I wasn't there. There was a girl that looked like me that was sitting directly behind them that a lot of people seemed to think was me, but it wasn't <laughs> me. <laughs> I was like, good thing. I was there without even having to go. Wonderful. Uh, it was like Anita Hill all over again. You know, Anita Hill um, was somebody who was testifying against uh, Supreme Court Judge Clarence Thomas in the 80s. Or maybe it was the 90s. And he had sexually harassed her terribly. And she was a young, brilliant African-American woman and to watch the racism and the sexism that got handed to her on a plate. The only thing different with the Christine Blasey Ford hearing was that she's white. So it didn't have that component. But it was like history repeating itself. But the difference is that I know the people watching at home would look at it in disbelief. Whereas in the past, with Anita Hill, they potentially could have watched it and been like, well, you know. I think there's a lot, even though it didn't have the outcome that it should have had, I believe that a lot more people 
stand with the people that are voicing truth and being brave enough to go up against the norm, which is just to stay silent and be a good little girl. And then, yeah, to the hand for the front row. Hi, thank you again for speaking. Um, you've spoken a lot about being brave, which is obviously something that a lot of people like struggle with, and you've kind of spoken about it as something that you've sort of had since you were a child, knowing that you were a brave person. Kind of, where do you think that's come from? Do you think you were sort of born with it, or it's something that's come from your quite difficult background? Or I think it's both. I was born with a real predisposition to hate and justice in all forms, and it bothered me terribly uh, when it was visited upon anybody around me. I, I, I couldn't stand it. But one of the things I will say about being brave is that it isn't just a magical thing that gets, you know, the wand that gets put on your head. It means that you have a lot of fear. And I'm riddled with fear. I've worked really hard to get rid of a lot of it, but you know, the mind is a slippery place. One of the things when fear really comes into our minds is to look at, could we survive this? And short of dying, we can survive pretty much anything. And every time you go through something scary that requires bravery, two things I do. One, I think, what would my better self do in this situation? Because I wasn't really raised in a, a way that helped me um, towards being brave, other than the fact that I was really on my own, so I had to do what I had to do, and that does help you along the path faster, I think, with bravery, because there's a lot of really real fears that are also true. The other thing is realizing that every time you go through something and you come through the other side, you're like, oh my god, I did that. I can't believe I did that. Damn it, now I'm going to have to do that again mm -hmm. in a different way. But watch me go. And I think it's a really beautiful thing to see. I think we'll have one final question. So yeah, the hand on the front row, Holly. Um, so you've been talking about how there's been progress is being made in Hollywood, gender equality within workplaces in general. But then, you know, sort of Trump, Trump gets voted in and then it sort of recesses again. And so where is it that people keep going wrong? What is it that makes people still make that decision? I think that's a real cult-like mentality. Um, it's interesting that a lot of people that vote for Trump, they hate Hollywood. And they see it as a bunch of fake liberals. And they're not far off. They can't see what's in their own backyard, apparently. The glaring, you know, elephant in the room. I think society expands and contracts. But I will say, I don't think I could have done what I did without Trump. I think he was very instrumental. And in the abstract, I'm grateful if we can survive him. He showed people clearly what sexism is. Before, for the longest, and it was the good people on the left, the liberals that had to learn it. The people on his side might not care, I'm not sure. But the other side that thought everything was solved and great, they're like, oh, these women just keep complaining about stuff. Just like kind of how black people keep complaining about they're getting shot by the police officers in America. Meanwhile, I'd heard about that since I was 14 years old. It's like, we all know. And yes, this is what we're complaining about with sexism. This is what we're talking about. But it showed it in such a black and white way that people are like, oh, that's what sexism is. Oh, that's what racism looks like. Yes. And in a bizarre way, although he is in power, boy, is it weird to say that. <laughs> it's really surreal being American right now, I have to tell you. I have this weird form of gratefulness to him 
because again, if we can survive him, he'll do a lot to show what we can't be, what we shouldn't be, what we should never be, and how we can be better. And I think we can use him as an illustration tool. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Rose. Unfortunately, that's what we've got time for. So ladies and gentlemen, please do join with me in thanking Rose McGowan.